Welcome again to another program with Camden Public Library um, for another talk with Mid Coast Audubon. And thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you to Mid Coast Audubon for once again providing us with fascinating talks. So I will hand it over to Will Broussard, who is here to represent Mid Coast Audubon, and he'll tell you a little bit about the organization and introduce our speaker tonight. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Julia. All righty. So once again, my name is Will Broussard, and I am one of the board members at Midcoast Audubon. We are a chapter of Maine Audubon, member supported with many uh, different programs, including uh, field trips and speaker series. We're very excited that we're bringing back our annual Hog Island Lobster Bake in September. So uh, check out more information um, on our website for, for details on that. And I uh, just want to let you know a little bit more about what's coming up this spring, uh, well, this winter into the spring. Um, so uh, of course, tonight we have Dr. Burakowski speaking, um, but our next field trip is going to be to Pemaquid Point on January 21st. That's coming up in two days, be uh, going to be led by Don Reamer. So that's pretty exciting. And coming up in February, February 11th, we have a field trip to Agunquit. So looking for some sea ducks there down in the south coastal area of Maine, February 11th. And then on February 16th, we'll have our next speaker. And this is going to be um, on uh, easy ways to increase access and inclusion for disabled birders. Uh, so that's going to be February 16th, 6 to 7 p.m. virtual program with Camden Public Library. And then in March, we'll have another field trip to Bitterford Pool and uh, surrounding. So all of this information can be found online at midcoast.mainaudubon.org. So tonight we're very excited to have uh, Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski from the University of New Hampshire speaking to us. It's very timely. So she's going to be speaking to us about um, climate change and the ski industry, both here in Maine and in New Hampshire, um, and how uh, actually the disappearance of our winters will be greatly impacting the ski industry that both of our states hold so dear. So we're very excited to welcome Dr. Elizabeth Burakowski. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's wonderful to be here. Well, I am technically in New Hampshire, but uh, to be here um, speaking with you all. So I'm going to take a moment here and share my screen. One second. There we go. I think everyone should be able to see that. Is that correct? Yep, that looks great. All right, well, let's get started then. Uh, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Um, I guess I'm a professor here down at University of New Hampshire. Our term starts on Tuesday, and this subject is uh, near and dear to my heart. I was actually just up at Gunstock in New Hampshire with my son. Uh, he's he's about eight years old, and he is learning how to snowboard this year again. And yeah, it's also where I did my, my ski club as a high schooler. So it was really fun to come full circle. So let's talk a little bit more about um, climate change. But before we do that, I, I do want to just give you a little... Um, description of myself. Uh, this is me and my twin sister in Wisconsin. I'm the one in the blue. And I, I would say this is still how I feel about snow nowadays. Uh, fortunate, unfortunately, we haven't had much, but tonight I think we're going to be getting some. And you'll see that face on me this morning, uh, tomorrow morning, um, if I wake up to some snow. And I moved to New Hampshire uh, very shortly after this photo was taken, probably within a year, couple years. And one of the first things my parents did was take us skiing. Uh, in New Hampshire, but we actually, we headed up to Maine, uh, to Vermont rather, uh, to go to our first ski area, but I've been to Sunday River and Sugarloaf, which are two of my favorites up in Maine. I'm um, hoping to get up there this season. Unfortunately, across the board um, in the United States, we've lost about 600 or so ski areas, and many of them are a lot small, little tiny hills like this one. This is Maple Valley in Vermont, and it closed, oh gosh, back in when was that? Sometime in 2000. And it uh, was listed for sale. And I think when someone finally purchased it, they actually decided to make it into a brewery instead of a ski resort. It's in southern Vermont. Um, and, you know, warm winters are really tough to overcome. So some of the, the closures that we've seen of these scarias are one, because they're small and it's hard to compete with the bigger resorts. Uh, other ones, it's because, you know, there's a lot of, of money that's required to make snow. 
Uh, some of it's also just due to really warm winters and not being able to stay open. So let's get this, some things in the way there, not letting me advance my slide. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so to start off, I just want to get everyone on the same page uh, where we're at with the um, state of warming temperatures globally. And then we're going to narrow down into the northeastern United States and see what's happening at a more local level. So I'll start this video. This is Earth's temperature from 1880 to 2020. And anywhere you're seeing areas in blue, Ooh, that's when Earth was cooler than average. We started in 1880. We're now up to the 30s. You'll see the U.S. light up in red there. That was the Dust Bowl. That led to really warm temperatures across the U.S. And then in the 60s, things got a little cooler, leading up to the Clean Air Act um, in the United States. Once we started cleaning up our air, then we started to uh, see the change in temperature really start to accelerate. Um, you'll note that much of the northern latitudes are warming at a much higher rate than the rest of the world. And we even have this conspicuous uh, cooling hole over here in um, the North Atlantic. Um, but note that right off the coast in the Gulf of Maine, this is one of the fastest warming bodies of water outside of the Arctic Ocean area. Um, so this is very concerning. I mean, I think you all have probably read about the impacts that this has, our potential impacts this will have on the lobster industry as well. But we're not here to talk about lobsters. We're here to talk about what's happening with climate. Um, and I would like to also start and just say that it's, very um, well accepted that the warming that you just saw in that video is extremely likely due to human activities. Um, and when we say that, we're saying this in a statistical sense, um, in that much of what we've seen in terms of warming has been dominated by what humans have been doing in terms of emitting fossil fuels. Now, when I think about how to show that to people. One of my favorite go-to graphics um, is this one here. This is an interactive graphic, so I'm actually gonna have to pop out of the um, screen share and go into a different screen for a second, but I'll, I'll briefly describe what you're going to see first. Um, we have a temperature graph here from 1880 to 2014. Um, they haven't updated this graphic since 2015, despite my numerous requests. Um, and anytime you're seeing something above the line, that means it was warmer than average. Below the line, it was cooler than average. Um, so what do we see? Let's take a moment and I'm going to click on this. And hopefully it should share the screen that we'll see here in just a moment. Okay, can you all see a Bloomberg? Um, yes. Graphic there. Yes, excellent. Yes. I okay, good, I'm glad the screen sharing worked. So as I... Thank you so much. <laughs> All right. So as we scroll down, what we're going to see are different changes in Earth's folks might have heard of or changes in Earth's orbit. Um, this was a phenomenon that was discovered really. Oh, I'm getting blurry. What's going on? Did that get blurry for everyone? Yeah, oh. but I would. Oh, that's what's going oh. on. <laughs> oh, that's annoying. That's never done that to me before. Um. Hmm. Sorry about that. One second. I'm going to have to try a different way. I'm going to stop sharing for a second. Sure. I'm so sorry. Why is it? No problem. Those things pop up. Hmm. I guess they don't want me using it anymore. Here, I have it on another one too. So let me just open that real quick. Nope, that's not working either. My apologies. Right, we will switch back to a different slideshow for a second. There's too many things in my way. One second. Oh, goodness me.
All right, this one should work. Okay, so instead of doing the one on Bloomberg, we'll do the uh, manual one. Um, so what we can do is we can run climate models and we can pull out different factors that affects Earth's climate. And in this case, we're looking at orbital changes. So this light blue line down here is showing what happens to Earth's climate and specifically temperature when you force the climate system with only changes in how Earth revolves around, result, uh, revolves around the sun. So that would include changes in Earth's tilt, it would include the changes in Earth's elliptical orbit, and it would also include um, changes in Earth's wobble of the tilt. Um, so all of these factors combined do lead to ice ages, but they do so on a much longer time scale. Like we're talking tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of years. So on the short time scale that we have for humans, orbital changes do not have a big influence on climate. It's only when you get to the grand scale of ice ages coming and going that we start to see that. So what can we else um, do we know causes changes in Earth's climate? Well, the sun does have a small influence as well. Well, we know that it, it drives the Earth's climate system, but the changes in Earth's, uh, sorry, in, in the sun's solar output don't change all that much. They account for less than 15% of the variability that we see in Earth's climate. And when you look at it over the period 1880 to 2005, again, it's really not showing a warming trend. And in fact, it's really just hovering around zero and there's not much of a huge influence here. So that observed warming that we've seen since about the 1970s or so cannot be explained by changes in the sun. What about volcanoes? Well, we know that volcanoes emit a ton of carbon dioxide, but it turns out it's it's a lot less than what we put out. Um, so humans emit about 100 times more CO2 than any volcanic activity that we see on Earth. So the volcanoes also have another influence on climate, not just emitting CO2, but they also emit aerosols. And these tiny little particles can block the sun and the ash can also block the sun, especially when it gets up into the stratosphere. So above where we live and higher up in the atmosphere. When that happens, it can cool climate and considerably. Uh, these major eruptions that we see in the climate record over the period of uh, the time that we have temperature records from instruments, you can see that we have these dips in climate that show up in a climate model when you only force it with changes in volcanic activity. But there hasn't been an increasing trend in CO2 emitted from volcanoes. So all we really see is the change from temperature that's cooling, not warming. So it's not volcanoes. What about if you combine all three of those? Well, if you, if you average all of those natural factors, so orbital changes, changes in the sun and volcanoes, we still do not match that observed warming trend that we've seen since the 1970s. If it's not nature, maybe it is humans. Um, could it be deforestation? Deforestation does release carbon to the atmosphere when you remove those trees, but we've also been seeing a lot of agriculture, which also emits CO2. We also see a lot of development, urbanization. And anytime you're replacing a dark forest with lighter patch, that actually leads to cooling. And what we see overall, um, in climate models is that we see a little bit of cooling associated with land use change, not warming. So again, that warming trend is not produced when you account for land use change only. What about ozone? So folks have heard of the ozone layer, really good up high because it blocks the UV rays, but it's really bad nearby because it's a strong oxidant and it can really damage your lungs. This is what leads to smog pollution. Ozone is also a greenhouse gas, but much weaker than what we would suspect, um, what we would expect from CO2. And there haven't been some long, any long-term trains in the increase in ozone at the ground surface level. So we don't see a really strong influence of ozone on this temperature record. So again, we're only seeing a little bit of hovering around zero, maybe a slight increase in temperature due to ozone pollution. What about aerosol pollution? Well, just like volcanoes, when we burn fossil fuels, specifically coal, it releases these small particles into the atmosphere that can block the sun and cause cooling. And if we only were accounting for the effect of aerosols, so subtracting out the effect of carbon dioxide, you would see a strong cooling trend. And this is why some folks have proposed to use aerosol injection into the atmosphere to cause global cooling. However, it also leads to acid rain. And I'm not sure folks know, but acid rain was, was a phenomenon that was discovered in New Hampshire. And it turns out it's really bad for ecosystems and also for our infrastructure. And it causes things to disintegrate. So that is not a solution there. When we look at greenhouse gases, so we force a climate model 
minus all of those other factors that I just showed you and only do greenhouse gases, that trend is reproduced, but it actually overshoots. So why don't we combine all of those things? Okay, we put in all the human factors. Now we can see that this is a much better match. We're overlaying the observed climate trends pretty darn well. We're missing out on the little nuances of these dips and, and valleys there. But when we throw in our natural factors as well, now all of a sudden we're really capturing the trend. So the take home message from that that I want you to, to have is that scientists use this type of fingerprinting technique to attribute the changes in temperature to human activity. That is where we get these statements that say it is extremely likely that human activities and especially greenhouse gas emissions like carbon dioxide are the dominant cause of the warming that we've seen since the mid, um, mid 1900s. Okay, so now I'm gonna stop here and I'll, if, the, if anyone has questions, they can feel free to pop in a question in the chat because I'm gonna be switching back to my other presentation. Just gonna close that one. Okay, now we're back. Right, so knowing that carbon dioxide is the dominant cause of warming, let's take a closer look at that culprit. From 1958 to, oh, I have to update this one. This one's from 2018, but until 2022, we have seen um, increases in atmospheric CO2 that's been measured at Mauna Loa Observatory. Now I've put some little milestones on here in my own life. Uh, you could probably do the same with your, with your life as well. Uh, starting in uh, the mid nine, well, I guess this would have been the late eighties. I started skiing at a resort that used to be known as Suicide Six. It has now been renamed as Saskadena Six or the Standing Mountain in the Abenaki language. And what we've seen is that, well, when I started skiing anyway, carbon dioxide was at 351 parts per million. By the time I started snowboarding at another small resort in New Hampshire called Pat's Peak, we were up to 360 parts per million. When I started my graduate program at UNH, 380 parts per million was the number that I had to memorize for my exams. And now my students, I probably will update this one again, the number they're going to have to remember for their exams is 420 parts per million, and it's increasing. So this is a big concern because it not only causes warming on a global scale, but it also affects regional um, temperatures as well. So let's start to zoom in now onto the northeastern United States and specifically into winter. So winter warming, since 1970, you can see New England's a bit of a hot spot, as it were, um, in addition to the Midwest. We have seen our temperatures in the northeastern United States warm on the order of five degrees Fahrenheit since the 1970s. And when I think about the 1970s, I, I think about the fact that that was when my parents started having us as children. I, mean, I was born in the early 80s, but my big sister was born in 1977. So this is over the course of a generation that we're seeing this level of warming. And for some places, um, what we'll see is that right around the Pennsylvania, New Jersey line, that's where things used to be below freezing in winter when my parents were growing up and now are above freezing. That would be what I would call the threshold response. And as we all know, once you reach above freezing, that's when you start to really start losing snow, seeing more of your winter precipitation fall as rain instead of snow. And you simply have fewer days with snow cover. We analyze this on a much longer time scale. Uh, my colleagues at Hubbard Brook and some folks um, from University of New Hampshire and other universities, we, we put together a report. Um, this was based on a peer-reviewed publication, and it's called Confronting Our Changing Winters. And what we wanted to know was just how much has temperature increased since a longer period of time, since the 19, um, 1916 was our start point in here. And I'm going to share with you our key findings from this report and from this study. One, we found that we are losing the cold in this region. So this is a, broadly of New England. Um, there are fewer days below freezing. We have less frequent extreme cold events. So think of days that are less than zero degrees Fahrenheit. We don't see nearly as many of those days as we used to. We're also losing snow. There are simply fewer days with snow cover um, across the Northeast and New England. And that's particularly true in springtime. That's when we've seen a lot of our, our um, shortening of the winter season. And it, it's, it, it's disturbing. Um, I was just recently out field sampling in New Hampshire last week, and 
well, it, it felt a lot more like mud season than it did winter. And that was very concerning because there was no snow. And not only was there no snow, the ground was thawed. So a um, bit of a problem. And overall, winters are simply shorter. Our sustained cold period, so the period of time when things dip below freezing and stay there, has really gotten a lot shorter. And in New England area, it's generally about three weeks shorter. So if there's one, one thing you want to take out of this is that winter is three weeks shorter than it was in 1960 than it is today. So what, how do we see what's going to happen into the future? Um, one of the main, another take home point that I want to show you when we get um, towards the end of the talk is, is what we can expect for our future generations. What type of winters will, will my kids experience when they're in New Hampshire and Maine and skiing with their kids? Um, so to do this, we use climate models. Um, this is a broad general description uh, schematic of a global atmospheric climate model or global climate model. Um, you can also imagine the layers going down into the oceans. This one's simply showing the atmosphere layers. We essentially divide the earth into these grid boxes, and then we have the flux of energy and matter being calculated based on physical processes between those grid boxes. And from that, we can determine what the temperature response will be when we change various factors like CO2 emissions and when we change land use. Um, but climate models have kind of gone on a, a bit of a journey in terms of their development. A climate model started off as simple radiative transfer models. They were taking energy from the sun. It would go through simulated layers of an atmosphere and reflect whatever was not absorbed by the surface back into the atmosphere. And then you have a simulation of greenhouse gases that would trap that heat. And I do this uh, a pen and pen, pencil and paper sort of exercise with my students. It would take a little too long to do right now. Um, but there are some simple exercises that you could do to build your own radiative transfer model using some really basic calculations that are based in physics. In the 1960s, we added nonlinear fluid dynamics in a hydrological cycle. Um, this would be known as what we call today an aquaplanet. So there were no land surfaces in these early models. In the 1970s, sea ice was revealed as being a very important part of the climate system and needed to be incorporated in models, primarily because it's very reflective and it reflects a lot of the sun's energy back out to space and helps to cool the earth. With the loss of sea ice, though, um, you start seeing a, a, a runaway feedback loop that is concerning because it enhances the initial warming that's caused by the emission of global uh, greenhouse gases. In the 1990s, atmospheric chemistry um, started getting incorporated and then aerosols and vegetation in the 2000s. Today, in the 2010s and into 2020s, now the models have really complex biogeochemical cycles and a carbon cycle not to mention nitrogen and phosphorus also being added in there. So they've gotten a lot more complex. They've also gotten a lot more finer resolution. So you could think of the ones that we had back in the 90s or so. They, they had some really large grid boxes. You can't even tell that this is Europe and Iceland in this photo. But once you get down to 110 kilometers, now you can start picking out features like mountains that might affect orographic precipitation. So as an air mass moves up and over a mountain, how much snow is it going to deposit? Well, that snowfall is rain. Turns out these are really important factors to have there um, in the models. So 110 kilometers was a, a pretty good resolution for a global model, but we run them at even finer resolutions. Um, and some of the data I'll show you later in the talk is actually at about a seven kilometer resolution, which is pretty fun. Now, I don't know if folks have ever, I, I've described what they do, but I don't know if folks have ever seen the inside of a climate model. Um, so what I'd like to show you now is what the guts of a climate model look like. This is uh, all available um, as open source code. We use Git, uh, GitHub specifically. So if you wanted to check out the climate model that I use and, and take a look at the code, uh, it is available online and open source. But I'll just give you a quick snippet of what the snow code of one part of the model looks like. That's it. It's code. Pretty boring if you think about it. Um, but this is written by scientists in combination or in uh, collaboration with software engineers to make sure all model parts of the models can talk. I won't go through each line of this uh, particular part of the model, but essentially it's saying, how does the snow age? And what is the change in how reflective that snow is as it ages? And again, this is just a snippet of a 1400 line plus line root module in the, um, in the model module in the model. So it's one little part of a much larger model. And there are millions upon millions of lines of code 
that are associated in this model and requires expertise from all different types of science, from oceanographers and biogeochemists to atmospheric scientists and cloud scientists. My focus is on the land surface model, and I want to know what happens to snow when you put it on there. So I hope you enjoyed seeing the guts of a climate model. If anyone uh, doesn't recognize the language, uh, this is written in, in Fortran. So this is a, a very, some folks would say ancient code. Uh, it's from, started in the 1970s, I believe, was the first uh, version of Fortran's. And uh, it's been evolving ever since. Some of the models are now written in Python, but overall, it's, it's a, a really efficient code base. So how do we, again, like, like, how do we see into the future? Well, we have to use that climate model, which has physically based and mathematically based physical processes embedded within it. And then we have to tell the model what's going to happen to CO2. So these are the global climate uh, carbon dioxide emissions from 1990 to 2022. And you could see we have our ups and downs. Starting in 1990, the dissolution of the Soviet Union led to about 3.1% decrease in carbon emissions. And then when the global financial crisis hit in 2008, again, there was a decrease, about 1.4%, so not quite as large as the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union. In COVID times, um, this is specifically in 2020, we saw a 5.2% decrease. A lot of this had to do with transportation being curtailed. And when we see a decrease like that, I, it's concerning because what this means is that only really large disturbances to our global, globally collect, connected economic and um, societal system are leading to reductions in CO2. Otherwise, the path has been fairly upward. Uh, the projection for 2022, I don't know if they finalized the numbers yet, was basically a rebound. So it's almost as if COVID didn't really happen. What happens if we decrease emissions though? That's what we wanna know out of the model. And we can give it some targets. We can tell the model, okay, here's our historical. This is where we ended up um, post COVID. What if we wanted to stay at two degrees of warming only? Well, that would require us dropping emissions from present day to 2080 to zero. And it would be a pretty steep decline. Another option, if we wanted to limit warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would have to start dropping emissions immediately and by 2040, I mean, that's a short, what, 15 years away or so. And that's, that's really aggressive. As you saw in the graph, it, it didn't look like that was probably happening at this point in time. So we can take these scenarios, um, that's one version of the scenarios is to give it a, a temperature target and say, how much CO2 do we have to remove out of the atmosphere? Another way to look at it is to think about what happens when we have these carbon emissions. What if we have a scenario where we're looking at what's known as radiative forcing? Radiative forcing is just how much extra energy is being trapped from sunlight coming in and then greenhouse gases trapping the, ex the heat that's trying to escape. So 8.5 means that there's 8.5 watts per meter squared extra being saved in the climate system and not getting re-radiated back out into space. So the aggressive strategy would have looked something like that blue line, right, going downward. The two scenarios I'm going to be talking about today are this one here, so 4.5 watts per meter squared um, scenario. We can call this a lower scenario, and then a much higher scenario where we really just don't do much about climate change at all, and we continue emitting CO2 on the same trajectory we had been. So let's take a closer look um, globally what that might look like. I just realized my box is off by a little bit. There we go. Um, the annual carbon emissions under this lower scenario that I'm going to be telling you about limits warming, we're going to convert back to Fahrenheit now, limits warming to about 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit above what we've already seen. So this is a lot of warming if we've already seen quite a bit in the Northeast United States. If we look at the carbon emissions, that means we peak around 2040 or so, 2050, and then we decline and we stabilize at five gigatons of carbon per year, which just seems um, unimaginably low. I mean, we haven't seen levels like that since about the 1990s. Then we could also look at the temperature response. So this blue line is showing that temperature response of about 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit by 2100. Okay, so that's our lower scenario. But what if we keep on emitting CO2? If we get up to 30 gigatons of carbon per year annually, then we're gonna see a much stronger temperature response. Globally, it'll be about plus, you know, an additional 7.7 .7 degrees Fahrenheit. That's a lot of warming, considering that we've already seen two. 
degrees Fahrenheit of warming globally. Okay, so we have our scenarios, we have our climate model. Let's put those two things together and let's see what happens in the Northeastern United States in terms of our, well, let's start with the ski industry. How about that? This is the number of night, the, uh, sorry, the percent reduction in the nights below negative five degrees Celsius. So this is a really strong, you know, like a, a decent temperature for you to make snow at a ski resort. If we act to lower emissions, the declines across the United, uh, the northeast, northeastern United States would probably be only on the order of about, what, 10 to 30 percent at the most. So that's, that to me is actually within the range of natural variability that we see. Um, some years we have high years, some years we have low years. Overall, by the time we get towards the end of the century, by 2100, we'll be seeing some of our lowest years that we've had in recent memory will be the norm. That's one way of thinking about it. Un oh, it says my screen sharing is paused. Is it? Um, we're still seeing the map. Um, oh, okay. Full season reduction in nights below uh, 5C below zero. I don't know why Zoom's telling me that then. That's okay. I'm glad you're, you're still seeing it. <laughs> I figured you would have spoken up if you did that. Um, and when I say full season reduction, what I mean is through February, um, if you started snowmaking in November and then you went through February 28th. Um, so we we kind of cut it off at, at the end of February because most resorts simply don't make snow in March. By then, they've decided to call it a, a season in terms of how much money it costs to make snow. We also can look at the full season reduction or under higher emissions. So what happens if we keep emitting CO2? Well, this is a much more dire picture. This is showing declines in some of the areas, especially in the southern part of the region, upwards of 60 to 80 percent. That that's pretty much game over for some of those resorts. In Maine, we, we look to be a little bit luckier um, in terms of the the number of resort, the amount of decline of of um, snowmaking nights that we would see. It would it would still be a, about a halving of the season. So I hope that we can come together. Um, anyone who who likes the ski industry, anyone who benefits from the ski industry economically, um, if we could come together and start acting on climate and see what we can save for winter. Another way to think about it is the date of snow disappearance. Um, so what we have here is a map showing from 1980 to 2005. So think of a historical record. When did snow disappear at different locations across the Northeast United States? Well, anyway, you're seeing these darker blue colors. It's probably closer to March. So think coastal Massachusetts, anywhere in Pennsylvania. Uh, as you get up into the northern, um, more northerly parts of the, the region and the higher elevations where most of our ski resorts are, it was typically around April to May. I mean, I think about skiing at Tuckerman's Ravine, you usually could go sometime in, in late April and into early May, then there'd be enough snow for you to go skiing there. What happens in the future with this date? Well, if we act under climate scenario, that lower climate scenario and re reduce emissions, we see a snow loss. So anywhere that's in gray simply doesn't have much snow anymore. Um, I'll toggle back to the first one so you can see the difference a little bit more dramatically. Most of the snow loss is going to be occurring in the Southern part of the region, as we would expect. Um, places like Rhode Island and Connecticut they probably won't have much of a snow season at all. Same with New Jersey and even half of Pennsylvania. Now, Pennsylvania is an interesting case study, especially when it comes to the ski industry, because they typically have more skier visits than New Hampshire and Maine. And that surprises some folks. Um, what you need to think about with Pennsylvania is the number of travelers that, or skiers rather, are, that are available from a greater New York City metropolitan area. They can make a day trip to the Poconos and go skiing, and that leads to a much higher number of skier visits in Pennsylvania. On average, it's about 3.4 million. Maine, for comparison, hosts about 1.3 million. New Hampshire is about 2.1 million. So if you combine Maine and New Hampshire together, you get close to what Pennsylvania draws. So a big question might be, what happens when Pennsylvania loses snow under this higher climate emission scenario, right? It's very concerning. I mean, we, we saw the snow making days decline a lot under that scenario as well. And we also see that the number, just simply the snow disappearance 
is occurring in March, sometimes even February, maybe, and that they, some regions just don't have snow at all. When I also think about this, I, I start to think back to my, my mom and dad, and they grew up in New Jersey, and they used to go ice fishing there. Um, you still can go ice fishing in New, in New Jersey if they have a decent winter, um, but most years it's, it's pretty troublesome. Uh, it's simply not the same climate that they grew up with in the 1960s and 70s uh, compared to what we have today. I certainly wouldn't be planning any ice fishing trips with my son down to New Jersey. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, I also look at this map and, and what I see is coastal New Hampshire. So I'm, I'm located at the University of New Hampshire, right where my cursor is. And it's snow free. I don't think I'll still be working as a professor in 2070 to 2099. Hopefully I will be retired by that point. I'll be quite old. Um, but anyone that I've trained to sample snow in New Hampshire at that point will have a hard time. I think about places like Winnipesaukee, Sebago, and when their snow disappears, how will the lakes be icing in? And it, it probably isn't a very rosy picture. Right now, I, I just drove by uh, Alton Bay on Winnipesaukee not too long ago. It was a couple days ago. And the Alton Bay was pretty much thawed out. Um, it wasn't even clear to me that the whole lake had even iced in yet this season. And I'm not sure on the status of Sebago. Maybe someone else knows. Um, but there is a lot of lake monitoring that goes on in Maine in terms of the ice out dates. And over the historical record, it's demonstrated that lakes are icing out earlier if they ice in at all. Um, some of the lakes, uh, Sebago in particular, I believe, um, had a number of years where it didn't ice in in recent memory. So what would this mean for the ski industry? I mean, I've talked a little bit about ice fishing, talked about the impacts on snowmaking, but what actually happens to skiers? And this is an open question. I, I don't have the answer to you, but we have some hypotheses. Uh, one option might be that people simply go further north. Uh, maybe it'll be more spring-like conditions as you ski. Uh, places like Sugarloaf would be very well poised in that regard, um, being at a much nor more northerly latitude and at a high elevation. Uh, this one in particular is from Cannon, so one of our more northerly mountains. Um, but that's something I think about. Are the folks that go skiing in Pennsylvania from the greater New York metropolitan area, are they going to make the trek all the way up to Sugarloaf? Are they going to boost skier visits in Maine in the future if that's where the snow is? Uh, some studies suggest that there, there are a number of folks that do move to where the snow is. They will continue to pursue snow um, wherever it may be. But other folks, they drop out of the sport and they find something else to do. Maybe instead in Connecticut, they'll decide to take up biking in winter or winter running. Um, I've been doing a lot more running than skiing lately, and it's been a lot of road running because the trails are all muddy as well. So that might be another option, is that they simply find a substitution activity to do. But we really, we, we won't know until it necessarily happens. We also just might see fewer skier visits overall. And this is something that we, we do see already um, when we have warm less snow winters, we do see a decline, and I'll be getting to that in a moment. Um, it's also just very expensive to keep those resorts open because snowmaking is expensive. And if you spend a ton of money making snow only to have it melt in January, that's problematic. It, it hurts bottom lines, and it can make things very difficult and challenging. But there's, I mean, there's options, and we'll discuss some of those at the end of the talk as well. So how did I study this? Well, in 2012, we, we published a report um, about the climate impacts on the winter tourism economy in the United States. And most recently, um, we updated that report in 2018. Uh, we are looking to do a, a, a third update as well at some point in the future. Um, we, we wanted to look at what happens during those warm, snowy winters and, and just what how big of an economic impact does this have? So looking at the um, in economic impacts, when considers the direct impacts, the indirect impacts, and the induced impacts. I'll talk a little bit briefly about each of those. So the direct impacts economically are just how much money are people spending on ski tickets and rentals at the mountain? How much are they spending on lodging at the mountain? So it's, it's, this is very much uh, centered on, on what's happening exact, uh, precisely at the mountain itself or at the resort. But there's also the indirect spending. 
So this would be people that are going, you know, to the resort, they go to the mountain, they go skiing, and then they go to a restaurant afterward. Maybe they rent a condo nearby. Maybe they stay at a hotel. All of that brings money into the community as well. And then we have the induced spending. So this is the type of spending that happens within the month, the, um, the local community. So folks who work at the ski resort or work at the hotel or the restaurant down the road, they in turn are receiving money for their wages and then recirculating that money in their local economy. If they get laid off during a warm, snow, snowless winter, then that means that the induced spending also goes down. So think of this month, this number that I have up at the top of the screen. This is the $11.3 billion. This is just how much money is circulating within the economy due to the presence of a ski industry. Across the United States, it's $11.3 billion and about 191,000 jobs. So it's it's not insignificant. This is a good chunk of change. And it's, it's not evenly distributed across the United States, clearly. Uh, places like Colorado, they lead the pack. 43 thousand jobs are supported by the ski industry. And this was in 2015-16. So this is just a snapshot. Um, when you look at California, 21,000 jobs. Places like New Hampshire and Maine, you know, we're, we're a bit more, more confined. Uh, it's closer to 5,000 to 4,000 um, number of jobs supported in our economies. And it, when we look at that, you know, this is, it's a winter job, but it's a job nonetheless. And it's, Concerning that a winter like 2015 16, I don't know if any of you guys, y'all remember that winter. Um, it was pretty terrible. I would say it rivaled 2012 in terms of just how snowless it was in our neck of the woods. And so I would, if you were to look at a much higher season, 2015, the year before, um, was a much better, um, a rosier year for, for skiing in the Northeastern United States. You can inflate those numbers by about 20% or so. And that would give you a better picture of what a good year looks like. Um, but this was a this was a pretty bad year for the Northeast in terms of a snapshot. When we look at the economic activity, so just again, how much money is circulating within a state's economy due to the presence of a ski industry? In a place like Maine, it's $276 million. And I would call this a very conservative estimate. Um, one thing I should note is that we don't include soft goods in this. So think of the sales that are going on um, in terms of soft goods. So ski jackets, they aren't necessarily sold at the ski resort. You might be buying them at L.L. Bean. That part doesn't get counted into this number. So um, consider that number to be much higher if you were to start factoring in those soft goods as well. But it's not a, it's even with it in a bad year, that's still a large amount of money. And that's not to mention any meal and tax revenue that might be coming in as well um, from folks that are spending money in the economy. So what happens across the U.S.? Well, what we did in the 2018 Protect Our Winters report is we looked at the 2001 to 2016 average. Uh, this was the data available at the time of the publication. And I want to note that this is well within the era of pretty high quality snowmaking. Snowmaking gets better every year, the technology improves. Um, but as of 2001, a lot of the resorts in New England um, were already making snow and including in Maine. So of those top five snowiest seasons aggregated across the United States, we saw an increase relative to the 2001-2016 average of about $692 million. So good years bring in more money to the economy when from the ski industry. You also have 11,800 more jobs available. During those bottom five years, we see a loss of about a billion dollars. So that means that that's a billion dollars that's not circulating in the economy due to the presence of a ski industry. And there's 17,500 fewer jobs. So these are, these are big numbers. And when I went to DC to go um, talk to lawmakers, this was back in 2012 with the first report. And I, at that point, I was only able to give, give them um, numbers for New Hampshire. It wasn't insignificant. And folks started paying attention at that point and saying, you know what, this is, this is a big part of a tourism-based economy is the presence of snow. And it's not just the ski industry. These are the numbers I've provided. But there's also a lot of money that comes into the state for snowmobiling for winter tourism that's you know not necessarily related to skiing per se, but just the fact that there is snow available. Now I'm gonna switch gears here and we're gonna go from the economics of climate change to more of the sociology of climate change. And specifically, um, I'm gonna talk about whether or not winter sports enthusiasts 
recognize recognize the warming. Um, so I, I had a hypothesis going into um, the study that I did with a sociologist that maybe, maybe, just maybe, because winter sports enthusiasts spend so much time out, so outdoors and because they rely so much on snow and cold temperatures to enjoy their sport, maybe they would recognize the warming more so than someone who doesn't participate in those sports activities. So I did this study in New Hampshire. It would be interesting to do this in Maine as well. And I asked 1,200 residents in New Hampshire, has it been cooler, sorry, has New Hampshire winter temperature over the past 20 years been cooler on average than winters 30 or 40 years ago as the bottom line? So within a generation, have folks noticed a change in temperature? Now, this is an answerable question because we have data to show how the temperature has changed in New Hampshire. And likewise, we would have that data available for Maine. It's really not too much different than New Hampshire, I'll tell you that. And we can see that from 1960s, 1970s, present day, indeed, there has been warming. We've had our up and down years. Some years, like 2015, were relatively cold and actually pretty darn good ski years. But overall, the trend has been towards warmer temperatures. Now, when we asked folks this, out of those, those 1,200 folks that answered the question, less than 38%, so less than 40, less than half, even recognized that it was warming in wintertime, which was interesting to me. Um, this is not broken down by whether they participated in sports. Uh, this is just simply across the entire sample size. But take home message that we got from the study was that fewer than one fewer than half the respondents even recognized the warming. Um, and my co-author on this, Larry Hamilton, he's down at the bottom. Um, his name's down at the bottom there. He did a study, uh, it was published in Journal of Climate across the North Country, so including in Maine, and it was pretty similar results. Um, they didn't see um, a really strong acknowledgement of winter warming, even in Maine. Uh, but also, more importantly, the awareness of winter warming was no higher among people that participated in winter sports. That had very, it was not a good predictor of whether or not you were um, recognize the warming, nor were there any big differences by age, sex, or education. So how much education you'd had didn't really have an influence, and it was across the board also by age didn't have an influence on whether they recognized the warming. Instead, uh, Larry had actually predicted this pretty darn well, the awareness of winter warming corresponded to their political identity. So if you were more liberal, liberal or moderate, they were much more likely to correctly answer the question whether or not there had been warming over the past 30 to 40 years. And conservatives and right-leaning folks, they were less likely to recognize that. So it's a political ideology that's underlying people's awareness of climate change. So how do we, how do we address that? How do we, we can't just show folks data and expect them to accept it. We've tried that. It doesn't, it simply doesn't work. You can keep beating that message in and, and repeating it as much as you'd like, but overall, this trend seems to persist. So what I, what I do instead um, is I try to connect with folks on what we call shared values, find folks that, that we have some sort of connection, and, and start from there. And I've been doing this work a lot with a, a nonprofit organization called Protect Our Winters. Uh, this is one of the co-founders. I happened to run into him. Um, in Alaska when I was doing some field work there. And um, he's been doing a lot of work on this front to try and get the folks that are engaged in outdoor recreation to recognize the impacts of climate change on their love, on, on what they love to do. And it, when you look at that from a perspective of, of what we see across America, um, another way to think about this is the global, what they call global warming six Americas. So similar to the, the survey questions that I had asked, this is a much more broader across the United States survey, where we ask a, a series of quick questions, or the, sorry, the survey people, this is not my work, this is from Yale. They ask a, a number of questions related to climate. And from that, they can, they sort the uh, respondents into one of six categories. They're either alarmed, so very well aware of what's going on and, and want to do something about it. They're concerned, but not quite sure what to do about it. They're cautious, meaning they're not doing anything about it yet and still learning about the issue. Disengaged, um, they don't hear about climate change. It's sort of a 
put their hands over their ears. They are not listening to any of the stories or studies on climate change. There are folks who are doubtful, who think, you know, eh, I think this is just, uh, maybe it's the sun or maybe it's this interannual variability that we're seeing these ups and downs. We have cold winters, we have warm winters, and they're just doubtful of it. Maybe a warm day in winter might make them think, oh, maybe this is happening. And then the next day, if it snows, yeah, I don't think it's happening. There's also the folks that are dismissive. No matter what evidence you throw at them, you show them, you try to convince them, nothing sticks. And they will continually deny that climate change is happening and that it's caused by human activities. So let's take a look at this and how this has changed over time in the United States. They started asking these questions in 2015, and this is a much larger survey. So this is data from 11 national surveys, 13,000 respondents. I mean, mine was 1,200, so my respondents was it's about a tenth of what they have in their data set. What we've noticed, or what they've noticed in their studies, is that from 2015 to 2020, there's been a 15-point increase in the number of people that are alarmed. So awareness is growing. There's also been, encouragingly, a five-point decline in the number of dismissive, in the percentage of dismissive, dismissive folks, and a three-point decline in the doubtful category. So what we're seeing is, is mostly that folks are moving from dismissive to doubtful, from doubtful to disengaged, although disengaged is such a small sliver, most people just simply move into cautious and then into concerned. And a large number of the concerned folks have been moving into this alarmed category. So that, that's, to me, it's, it's encouraging that we, we see a much larger percentage of people that are, are actually concerned about the problem and, and enough that they're alarmed and they want to see action. We can also look at the demographics of these respondents. Um, so this was based on an April 2019 survey that they did. So think of this one as a much smaller snapshot. This isn't the entire period of record. One thing they notice is that amongst the dismissives and doubtfuls, there is a much higher percentage of dismissives and doubtfuls within the white population compared to Black or Hispanic Latino. And that, to me, is very interesting. And I think it also points to the fact that Black, Hispanic, Latino communities are also disproportionately impacted by climate change. When you are personally impacted by climate change, you might be more likely to acknowledge that it's happening. Um, we didn't see this in winter sports enthusiasts, um, but I wonder if we see this in terms of coastal infrastructure, um, folks who live on the coast, people who are impacted more so by air pollution. Um, a lot of poorer communities, less resources, are located downwind of, of power plants that are burning coal and oil and uh, fossil fuels in general, I should say. So this is, this is another link back to the ski industry, though, because the ski industry is predominantly white. So within I, this category, I see an opportunity. We have a number of folks who are probably in that dismissive category that are also skiers, and they might be in the doubtful category as well. And there's opportunity to try and move them along into the, the journey of, of accepting that this is a problem and that we need to do something about it. So what exactly is the winter sports community doing? Well, the first thing that they're doing is they're getting political. And this is the, the work of Protect Our Winters. Um, from the left, we have Auden Schendler. He is the Vice President of Sustainability, I believe, at, at Aspen. Uh, this is Jeremy Jones. He was the co-founder of Protect Our Winter. So this is the professional snowboarder you saw on the pre um, previous um, picture that I showed. Gretchen Bleeler is an Olympic snowboarder. And then Chris Davenport is an Olympic professional skier. He's originally from New Hampshire, but now based um, out of Colorado. And when these folks are able to go into a senator or representative's office and talk to them about the impacts of climate change on their communities, on their sport, on their training or on their bottom line, in the case of, of um, big resorts, they get to have a voice and they can provide a, a perspective that's different from your traditional lobbyist who's been hired to do that. Um, that to me is the difference. And when I go and lobby with them as well, I'm, I'm going to my senator's office and my representative's offices as not just a someone who's lobbying, but as a scientist, as a mom, as someone who lives and, and loves New Hampshire, 
And I would say the same could be said about Maine. And there are folks in Maine that do this, that can go in and say, as a scientist, as a parent, as someone who cares about Maine, I want to see climate action. I want you to support this bill. I want you to um, raise these types of policies up for debate within the House or the Senate. And that we have to do this because the fossil fuel industry has been doing it much longer and with much more money. This is the way American politics works, and we I think we can all acknowledge that. Uh, most recently, uh, Jeffrey Suprin, who is a, I don't know if I pronounced his last name, maybe Supron, um, he published a study in just recently about the history of Exxon's climate science. And what we have here, this is a graph from a 1982 Exxon Mobil, uh, sorry, they weren't merged yet, Exxon publication. This was an internal memo. And they're showing over time the years. So they started in 1960 to the year 2000 and then out to uh, 2100 here, I guess would be what you would call that. And you're looking at the atmospheric carbon dioxide levels. And then on this axis is the average temperature. This blue line is what we've observed for carbon dioxide concentrations. This black thin line that it's hugging is what the Exxon scientists found. They knew that CO2 was going to continue increasing even when they published this in 1982. When they look at the most probable temperature increase, that's this other thin black line and the red temperature change that we've observed, they were pretty spot on. I mean, we're not, if anything, we're overshooting the temperature response a little bit. Um, that's concerning. They knew back in the 1980s what would happen if we continued to pump CO2 in the atmosphere. They knew what the temperature response would be. And yet this information was willfully hid and instead they continued to lobby for rights to continue burning fossil fuels and reduce regulations on that. And I think, I think this is an important part of understanding why we have a climate problem and why we haven't seen action because we're fighting against this against multi-billion dollar international companies that have a really strong vested interest in protecting their assets and protecting their oil and their gas and their coal. Um, if you were interested, there is a great little article that was published in 2021 about how the ski industry stopped worrying and learned to love climate activism. Um, when I first got engaged in this work, I, I remember going to the, um, it was the See, Snow Sports Industries of America snow show that they hold in Denver every year. It was recently sold to outdoor industry, I believe. And at that at a research forum, I presented my earliest work, I think it was in 2010, on what happens with global warming and, and skiing and the future of snow. And it was sort of a meh response out of a lot of the folks that were there. They didn't seem to particularly care that this was a problem. I remember chatting with some person um, at the at the conference, and and they said, "What? This isn't a problem at all. Like we've sold more boots this year than we have ever. This isn't something that we're concerned about at all." And now, if I were to go back to that show, um, this is I, I haven't been since I think twenty. I don't remember the last year I went. Might have been twenty sixteen. This is a topic. This is a topic everyone's talking about within the industry, and no, very few people, I feel, at least, are turning a blind eye to it. They know it's there. They're not sure what to do yet. But some resorts, they do know exactly what to do, and, they, and they're doing it. They're reducing their emissions. They're increasing energy efficiency. When you look at these ski towns and, and how much energy it costs to make snow, one of the first things they can do to reduce their, their costs and increase their bottom line is to start reducing their emissions and move towards renewables that are less expensive than burning fossil fuels. They're also bringing science to the mountain. Uh, this is a little bit less frequent, um, but there have been some resorts that have, have really embraced the idea of, of bringing scientists to the mountain to talk about what's happening. Um, I say it's, you know, it's important to have a very positive message that, you know, if we act, we can save a lot of winter. Um, but it, it's, it's one of those things that just like, well, why aren't we doing this more? Why aren't we seeing more people um, being able to connect with folks that, that understand the problem and what's going on? 
Resorts are also doing some snow farming. Um, this was an alpine glacier that was melting and ski resorts decided to put a, a big white tarp on it to help preserve the snow. Uh, there are some glaciers where a lot of Olympians and, and professional skiers go to train because there's snow in the summertime and they can train not year round, but well into the May and June. But those are, are becoming less frequent. So snow farming is, is one way to help preserve that snowpack for the following season. Um, I've also heard of other folks putting sawdust and, and uh, straw over snow piles to help preserve that snow. So should they end up with bare patches, they can truck it over and, and spread it out again over that. And it's much easier to make snow on snow as opposed to mud. Um, it's much more likely to stick to something that's already frozen and stick around. Uh, if I already, <clears throat> excuse me, I already mentioned efficient snowmaking. Um, again, this has improved phenomenally over the years. Uh, in the 1970s, you know, it was a, a much harder bargain to use snow and water, sorry, energy and water efficiently to make snow. But today's snowmaking machines can make more snow in a fraction of the time and cover much more acreage using less water than they did in the 1970s. And even five years ago, they've improved quite a bit. Uh, this one particular photo is from the Berkey. Um, this is a, a big Nordic race, and they had to cancel it in 2017 because they didn't have enough snow and it was on safe con trail conditions. So even Nordic resorts are now investing in snowmaking capital to make sure that they can still have a season and safely have races. Four season business models. I mean, a lot of the resorts that were originally founded, um, at least in the Northeastern United States, started out as summer resorts and skiing was sort of their side gig. And as skiing grew in popularity, that became the main um, attraction. And today we're kind of reverting back and seeing resorts that realize they have a lot of infrastructure that's appealing for places, uh, events like weddings, family reunions, conferences. Um, conferences can be a great place, uh, can be held at at resorts in summertime for a pretty good bargain. Uh, we used to do one at, when I was a postdoc at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Colorado, we would hold our annual conference um, up at Breckenridge because the, the hotel rooms were ridiculously cheap. Um, it was a, a really good deal to be able to do that. And I'll just, I'll conclude with a, a much more a hopeful, a hopeful message as well, is, is what can you do? Well, the most important thing that you can do is talk about climate change. Listen to experts. Find out how climate is changing in your neck of the woods and understand that talking to your, your friends and family, you know, connecting on shared values first and then talking about how climate is changing in their region, how it might impact them, that's a really important part of the conversation. And it, one of the primary messages that um, the folks at Yale had found when you talk about climate change, um, what really helps people move along um, to accepting that it's happening and that it's caused by human is to talk about the scientific consensus around climate change. So if I want you to come by, uh, come out with one number, is that 97%, and it's probably even higher now, 97% of scientists that study climate around the world agree that global warming is happening and that it's due to primarily due to human activities, specifically the burning of fossil fuels continue to have those conversations. Um, one thing I did want to mention as well, if you want to talk about climate change in Maine specifically, the Maine Climate Report. Um, I will provide a link to that um, to Will and, and Camden Public Library so that they can provide that to you as well. Um, but with that, I would like to leave some time for questions. Um, so I'll say thank you. This is my contact information. Um, and do check out protectourwinters.org. They've been doing a lot of cool work on uh, the field of advocacy and activism. So thank you. And I will stop sharing as Thank well. you so much, Elizabeth. That was fascinating and I'm feeling uh, inspired <laughs> to <laughs> talk about it more. Great. And I'll just, I'll put in the chat right now while I'm remembering it. This is to host and panelists. Um, this is a link to the main climate report. And this one's a flip book version. So it's a nice, easy way to, to kind of flip through without having to download a PDF. But they've got some really great figures and implications for Maine specifically that I might not have had time to touch on today. Mm. Thank you. That's really helpful. Yeah. yeah, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop it in the chat or the Q&A box. And I'll read it out loud. 
Sure, and that maybe I can start off since um, um, I kind of hold a dual Maine, New Hampshire um, life since I spent, um, you know, 10 years of my adult career in New Hampshire, um, seeing a lot of this, the ski industry firsthand. Um, and Western Maine to a lesser extent, but I'm curious since I've seen it in New Hampshire, um, Doctor, are you seeing um, more ski industries kind of talking about the idea of um, adapting to the lower s snow, you know, regime as opposed to kind of, you know, hoping that it's going to get better at the at this point, it's clear, the science is clear that um, we are losing our winters. And um, and it seems like more and more the consensus is that, well, we're going to have to adapt to the change rather than necessarily um, try to work against it. And I'm wondering if you're seeing um, that kind of trend, at least in the ski industry. Well, yeah, I can speak for New Hampshire because I've... I've um been in touch much more with the Ski New Hampshire industry trade group. So they're the ones that um, represent a number of resorts in New Hampshire. And within Ski New Hampshire, I'd say from the time I had started, you know, connecting with them to today, my impression is that there's a lot more acceptance of that this is an issue and that we are going to have to continue dealing with these low snow winters in the future. And we've already seen a lot of adaptation. I mean, the snowmaking operations are so slick these days. The grooming is pretty phenomenal. I've seen some resorts that are um, converting, they're purchasing electric powered um, groomers instead of, which are still much more expensive, um, but they're, they're working on that. And I would say the one thing that they really should be focusing a lot more on, and maybe they're doing this a lot more behind clo closed doors and I, I don't see it as much, but lobbying talking to their representatives and their senators about the impacts that they're seeing as a resort owner, as a business owner, communicate that to them and, and let them know what the impact is. I can give the big hammer approach and say, this is what my model shows in terms of economic impacts. I can't, I don't have the receipts necessarily from a store. What I have are, are economic multipliers that I can use to calculate and estimate how much the impact has been. But the impact is much more than money. It's also a loss of, you know, a, a cultural tradition. For some folks, you know, being able to get out on Sebago and do your ice fishing with your kids is, is something that you really want to do. And you can't put a price on that. And I, I think that's another factor that really needs to get through to the policymakers. And that, that message comes through people talking about climate change with them. Yeah. But yeah, adaptation is always going to be on the menu and, and mitigation through policy and advocating strongly for those policy changes is something that needs to happen. Yeah, that's because great. And um, uh, and you mentioned you've done some lobbying. Do you um, do you get the sense that that New, at least New Hampshire's the delegation is, you know, on board um, with the current science? At, yeah, so... <laughs> That's a tricky question because we are a purple state, right? We have a, a Republican governor, but we have a Democratic delegation in Congress. And so Annie Custer, Representative Annie Custer, she's not my district. She's uh, the next district over. She's the co-chair of the uh, Bipartisan Ski and Snowboard Caucus. Uh, there was a, a great little article that came out in the Concord Monitor recently about the, her work in that area. And she recognizes it. Her family owned Wildcat Mountain. I think it might still be in their family. I forget. Um, but this is, you know, like skiing is a big part of her family's tradition. And it's also a big part. She recognizes the contributions economically and culturally that skiing provides New Hampshire. I mean, we are a tourism based economy. In the wintertime, visitor spending in New Hampshire contributes almost half from the ski industry. That's not an insignificant chunk of change. Um, so I, th I think it's part of what makes New Hampshire, New Hampshire. And when I think of Maine, I mean, I, I think of skiing because that's where I go skiing, but I also think of snowmobiling. I also yeah. think of ice fishing. I mean, it's, there's just so much land to be explored in wintertime up there. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Looks like we have a, one comment from Osmina. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but um, Asmina says, really enjoyed your presentation. Thank you so much for all you do to raise consciousness on this problem. 
I always wonder how come people don't realize what is going on. I wonder the same. <laughs> I look outside my window and I see mud and snow in Jan like mid to late January. And I, I, I say, how can you not recognize it? Yeah. And I also hear, I won't name any names, but I, I had recently read, um, it was an article I was quoted in and another person from the ski industry was quoted, quoted in it. And this person said, well, it, we've got tons of snow here and I think we're in California. And I, I just had to pull my hair out and say, you've got, okay, that, that's great. You've got tons of snow. Have you seen what's going on in Europe? Have you seen their green slopes with ribbons of white? Have you seen what's happening in the eastern United States? I mean, we don't have any snow. And furthermore, I mean, like even more locally, do they recognize what damage those atmospheric rivers are doing to infrastructure with flooding and landslides? And, you know, it was one of those things like, wow, that's that's great that you have snow right there, right then where you are. But that doesn't mean that climate change isn't real. It's it's time for, for folks to really, there's no excuse for not thinking globally at this point. We we have plenty of sources of information to show you what's going on in other parts of the world. Yeah. 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 I have one question. Um, I wondered if you knew of any ski resorts that have been popping up farther north, like if there's kind of a, a shift in which there are new ski resorts opening up um, purposely farther north in order to, you know, make the most of what's happening in terms of new investments there are very very few across even just the united states in general mm -hmm. let alone in northern new england uh the last i had heard it's not even a new one it's just a revitalization of balsams and i i actually have lost track of where that left off i don't know if they opened or not um but it's business wise the opening of new ski resorts is not been happening up north because they're just as vulnerable. I mean, I, I look at what's been happening in wintertime and saw that. So one of the photos that I'd shown was a, a pair of skis on a bare slope. <laughs> that was one of the more northerly resorts in New Hampshire, mm -hmm. like one of our northernmost resorts. And they had no snow. That was in early January. Like they couldn't even make it. So as in they couldn't even make snow. They are there. Yeah. Just, business. Um, so I don't see that as being it. What I do see is market console. There might be some market consolidation. So as resorts further south, Connecticut, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, even Pennsylvania, if those resorts, you know, if we don't act and those resorts can't make it, maybe we'll see an increase in skier visits at more northerly resorts. Um, but that remains to be seen. Yeah. Any more questions from the audience. Well, then I guess thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thank you, Will. Thank you, Midcoast Audubon. Um, I definitely learned a lot this evening. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. It was great to talk with you all, and I hope you can check out the main climate report. Yes, I will be uh, uploading a recording of this on the Camden Public Library YouTube channel, and I'll also link the main climate report there as well. So people Sounds can fantastic. take a look at it. Great. Good night, everybody. All right. Good night, everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.